Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual stage of Milwaukee Rep. My name is Njieme Russell Kamara, and I am the Associate Director of Engagement and a member of Milwaukee Rep's Q, which stands for Champions Uniting Experiences. Happy Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And if you're all the way in New York City or Los Angeles, or you're in Denver, all the way to New Orleans, or you're here in Milwaukee, feel free to do a woot woot wherever you are and wherever you're located. Know that tonight is truly about celebration and listening to the truth of the personal experience. And most importantly, it's listening and celebrating AAPI diasporic cultures inside and outside of the theater. We are Milwaukee Rep, and so of course, it must come back to the theater where it is our jobs as theater makers to explore what it means to be human and to see our fellow human beings. And speaking of a human experience, we would be remiss if we did not take a moment to think of our neighbors in India who are fighting to just breathe. Let us keep that in mind that although we may have a conversation specific to the US, there was a lot going on in the AAPI community around the globe. And so bringing it back to theater, we have an amazing lineup of panelists who, although live outside of Milwaukee, have worked with Milwaukee Rep as artists. Some of them I have performed with in our Quadrachi Powerhouse Theater or have been in the same season of shows with. And as a first generation American woman of Filipino and Gambian descent, it feels really good to be able to facilitate this panel of fellow AAPI theater makers. I'll bring our panelists on it in just a moment, but here's a little welcome from an actor who you may have seen recently on Disney Plus, or if you're a fellow millennial, you may have first seen him playing opposite Brandy, Bernadette Peters, and Whoopi Goldberg, especially if you tried to tape this version of Cinderella off the TV, and you always fast forwarded your VHS through the commercials of Folgers and Fisher Price that you had no choice but to also record, and yes, I'm speaking from experience. Here to welcome us further into the night and AAPI month in general is stage and screen actor Paulo Montalban. Thank you, and J. May Russell Kamara. And hello to everyone out there joining us. Welcome to Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month all around the country and here at Milwaukee Rep. This month reminds us that we can celebrate the AAPI community, not just as a whole, but also as the many diverse nationalities and cultures that make it up as well. You know, what I love about this month is that even as seemingly different as our upbringings may have been, with a little curiosity and an open heart and mind, we may see that we share a lot more in common than we once thought. It is particularly important to celebrate given the recent rise of anti-Asian hate crimes across the country. These seemingly random acts of violence and hate have arisen from the false narrative that Asian Americans were responsible for the coronavirus pandemic. Asian American hate crimes have existed for over a century in our country, have been inflamed by this COVID blame, and are now only being documented thanks to social media. As you can see, misinformation leads to fear Fear leads to hate, and hate leads to violence. What if we replaced that misinformation with truth? It would lead to courage, love, and peace. The AAPI community has experienced so much shock, anger, sorrow, fear, confusion, and anxiety because of these attacks. This month can serve as a salve to heal and rebuild the bridges between us. We can use this moment to stand together as allies and as friends. Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month is important to me because I'm a passionate believer that education is the key to understanding each other. And when I say education, I'm not just talking about reading books or history. Now, those are important too, yes, but you can't feel them on a visceral level. Now I'm talking about the education of food, music, dance, art, stories, oral history, movies, 
I see you Asian and Asian American Oscar winners. And yes, theater. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever visited a foreign country or maybe even a different city in another U.S. state? And you go to all the must-see tourist spots, but you feel like something's missing from the experience? I don't know about you, but I understand a community and its people the most when I'm invited into someone's home and I get to eat the local food with them. We share stories and we laugh together. I challenge all of you, regardless of your background or ethnic heritage, to step out of your comfort zone. This month, try to experience something new to you from the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And to all my API brothers and sisters out there, this month I challenge you to be extra special hosts of the rich culture you come from. Instead of fitting in, try reaching out. So no matter where you are in this country, Celebrate, be curious, make space for voices that need to be heard. Speak up so we can hear yours. Be a leader, be an ally, listen, learn, and most of all, don't let it end on May 31st. I'm Paolo Montalban, and I'm a proud Filipino American. Welcome to Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. All right, thank you, Paulo, for your time and your spirit and your wise words and the good challenge for all of us. Now, without further ado, we are gonna bring on our panelists tonight. First, we have Ponchana Kanchanabanka, who's a Thai artist, sound designer, musician, and composer. Her recent productions include Skylight at the MacArthur Theater, The Great Leap at Steppenwolf, Miss Bennett, Christmas at Pemberley at Milwaukee Repertory Theater. And Nock has worked with theater companies across the United States, including Lincoln Center, Rattlestick, Jiva Theater, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, among many others. And she's collaborated with performing groups and theater companies in Thailand since 2008, and is a proud graduate from the Yale School of Drama. Welcome, Nock. Next, we have Lisa Helmi Johansson, who's a singer, actor, musician, producer, and selected works include Off Broadway, Avenue Q, Einstein's Dreams, which was in the original cast, The Drowning Girls, Three Sisters, Anything Goes at Arena Stage, Viet Gone at Denver Center, The Chinese Lady at Milwaukee Rep, where she had the Best Actress Award for Milwaukee Broadway World. Amadeus at Syracuse Stage, once at Cape Playhouse, Law and Order SVU. And she spanned out to producing during this pandemic and is close to launching a sitcom podcast called Preschool. And she's active in racial justice work through her Interfaith Justice Queens and Court Square Justice um, organization, as well as serving on the AAPI Advisory Council for the DA of Queens NYC. Welcome, Lisa. Next, next we have A. Ray Pamatmat. His most recent work is in, as a collaborative libretto for Desert Inn, premiering in 2021 at the Boston Lyric Opera. His newest play is called Safe, Three Queer Plays, which follows the seismic changes in queer America through a gay man of color's life. And other selected works include All the Terrible Things I Do, which was at Milwaukee Rep, including Huntington and About Face. Another play called Edith, Edith Can Shoot Things and Hit Them at the Humana Festival and Company One, House Rules at Maggi, Thunder Above, Deeps Below, Second Generation, and Deviant. And for television, he wrote on Nosferatu and is developing a pilot with AMC. And his plays have been translated into Spanish and Russian and performed in Moscow, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. Welcome, Ray. And next, we have Rebecca Hirota, who's a New York-based actor, choreographer, and communication consultant. She's performed in Junk and Jane Eyre at Milwaukee Rep, and other selected works include Viet Gone at the Manhattan Theater Club, Romeo and Juliet at Classic Stage Company, Caviar on Credit at the Guthrie, The Most Deserving at the Denver Theater Center, Cry It Out, City Theater, and television includes Law and Order, Elementary, Unforgettable, and Gossip Girl. 
And as a communication consultant, she helps companies and individuals examine their bias blind spots and find common language to begin bridging divides. And she has a, she's a proud um, alum of Columbia University where she got her MFA. So welcome, Rebecca. All right, so hello, phenomenal panelists. It's great to share our virtual stage with you. And we're just here to have a conversation in which other people get to listen in on. So let's dive right in and we'll keep it conversational and I'll ask a bunch of questions and whoever feels moved to answer first can go. I'll also call on you as well. So to start off, can, can you share with us a little bit about your heritage? What do you celebrate this month? What do you carry with you? Who do you carry with you? What, what do you love to celebrate about your heritage? Um, I can go first. So <laughs> I will, I'll say it has a, um, so this month is a Mother's Day. I will say my mother, this will be one thing uh, that I say a bit from. So my, I'm from Bangkok, Thailand. So right now my mother also in Thailand. So I thinking of her and another person that I would like to celebrate is my mentor in Thailand. His name is Kanti Anantakan and he's a sound designer, a Thai sound designer. Ray, how about you? Um, I mean, you know, I celebrate everything. I mean, it's like, I, you know, right now I'm very lucky to be in another TV room where I have a lot of other Asian American. Uh, it's like a half, half the room is Asian American. So like to me, a lot of this month and a lot of just being an artist is being able to surround myself with people like this room uh, to, you know, I am <laughs> like, and then just random things. Like I am watching Warrior for the first time right now on HBO Max, please check it out. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and um, you know, and yes, of course Mother's Day just passed. So uh, we are making plans pandemic wise to finally see family uh, sometime in August. So hopefully, hopefully that's gonna all work out. Rebecca, how about you? So, hi, I'm Rebecca. I am Japanese American on my father's side and uh, from New Orleans on my mother's side. And this month is such a, an interesting celebration because I'm from Hawaii originally. Uh, I think as Paula was as, as well. Um, and it's a unique culture because two thirds of the population is either Asian or mixed Asian, but it's still very, it's still very American. And so it's an interesting experience. And this month sort of reminds me of everything that I am lucky to have as having been culturally able to celebrate what I am a part of, but also never feeling necessarily other to buy it. It's, it's sort of about the unique experience. And so it's been a really beautiful and joyful remembrance in this time where other things have been fraught. I guess I'm last. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa. I am half Korean and half Finnish. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, this this API Heritage Month is, is um, I well, I'm acknowledging it and kind of reflecting on it in ways that I truly just haven't in the past. And um, throughout the pandemic, I have also been kind of gravitating towards uh, learning some friggin' Korean food recipes. You know, I always eat, I mean, I live in New York. I can get great Korean food whenever I want in non-pandemic times. Um, and my family lives uh, down in the Atlanta area. So they are not very close. And, uh, and we have not seen each other during this, um, during the pandemic, but uh, so it kind of fell upon me. I was like, you know what? It's time. Lisa, learn how to cook some Korean food. So um, that's been, and, and for me, like I've always said, oh, I want to learn how to cook things and, and make more traditional dishes. But um, it, it's been a little bit more of a profound act for me in learning how to make these things that I so deeply um, associate and connect to my mother with. Um, and, uh, thankfully I had just gone to South Korea for the first time ever, just the summer before the pandemic hit. And so that was a whole other, 
I mean, re revelation of, you know, the connection that I have with that country um, that has been uh, a beautiful thing to, to relive in little bits through just the food that I'm learning how to make. Yeah. Well, Lisa, I'm so glad that you brought up, you know, how you've kind of been, you know, adjusting and learning, you know, the beauty during this time of the pandemic. And I'm so curious for all of you, how has the pandemic influenced your artistry? What new things have come up? How have you adapted? Well, I think for me, like there's been, you know, as a, I, as a playwright, like, you know, you always kind of write things with this uh, sort of thing lingering in the back, back of your mind, like this is never going to get produced, you know? And uh, when the pandemic began, it really becomes this, you know, it really was like theater shut down. You're like, this is really never going to be produced. <laughs> and so <laughs> um, what has been kind of strange is that it sort of put me back uh, to, uh, when that was more of a reality for me. And so my playwriting has actually been quite free during the pandemic um, in terms of uh, creatively, I've just been, I've been writing about anxiety dreams, just to be honest. And so, you know, there's no, it's a lot of writing that doesn't make any sense and probably couldn't be staged and is a lot of fun. Like uh, there's something about the pandemic that's taken a little pressure off um, of what I'm doing. So, you know, and I, I don't mean to make it sound like it's all puppies and rainbows because they are anxiety dreams, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, it has been a, it's it, part of the pandemic has been a fun respite for me. Yeah. Nock, how about you? Um, I think one part of it is uh, my pandemic world is, is, dealing with babies. So I become a mother during the pandemic. So I was mm -hmm. kind of struggling with becoming a mom and what is becoming mom and being an artist. Because mm -hmm. I feel when I'm an artist, I have a little selfish of having time for myself to make art. But when I have a newborn, they have to wake up every two hours to feed her and I just like need to sleep. Then somehow I lost my art for like three months of like trying to figure out where are those, even though like we are so like, it's like a luck in the in the midst of all this thing that we able to be with her this whole time. But at the same time, I miss the other so much. I miss being with other people. And now I kind of like grab the little time that I have. I used to like, like to like play music and I'm not able to do, but one thing that I can do is like a little doodle and draw. So it was like a little thing for myself to keep moving forward. And also like some of it is like a little poem about being a mom or I don't know, being an artist and being a mom just to reflect something out. Yes. So that's, that's for me. <laughs> and Lisa, you mentioned that you were doing some producing. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Well, um, it really, it, it stemmed from pandemic necessity, um, but my husband's best friend from high school randomly texted me early in quarantine and was like, I don't know if you have time to like read this pilot I've written. And I was like, I have a lot of time. <laughs> like I just left a job. I didn't have anything planned for two more months. Like send me whatever you want. So he sent me this pilot and it was really fun. And I was like, oh, snap, let's do something. And so we decided to adapt it to be a podcast. Um, so it's a sitcom podcast that we've been um, working on through this pandemic. And um, it has, you know, become, I don't know, especially because, because of everything that our industry has been going through, um, both in just coming to a complete standstill to upheaval you know, and, and so much oftentimes painful reflection on, on what people's experiences have been mm -hmm. within the industry. Um, it kind of became a, a really small place where I could at least create a safe space for the artists that I brought in. And, um, 
and not to say that I haven't been part of, you know, theatrical experiences that have been beautifully heart led or very human centered. Um, but it felt like that was at least something that I could contribute energetically, positively, you know, to the world and the industry. And so um, it's been a huge learning curve <laughs> um, because I'm also doing a lot of the sound editing and mm -hmm. kind of like the showrunner. <laughs> so it's so it's it's been a lot of learning, but we um, it's really fun and we care a lot, even though it's a sitcom to be casting people who are authentic voices and, 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 you know, unique stories, you know, to marginalized communities. Um, so yeah, that's been, that's been one form of the pandemic. I mean, speaking to like the anxiety dream writing, I just like, I mean, it, it is going to take a slightly dark turn kind of quickly, but honestly, even after, after the, Atlanta shootings in particular, I have been writing like crazy. And I, I guess I didn't really realize that like during the pandemic, I had been writing more in general because I usually would wake up in the middle of the night and just word vomit a ton mm -hmm. and then kind of try to go back to sleep. And, and it wasn't until I started writing more after the Atlanta shootings um, and kind of compiling things and, and finally just being brave enough to just post them online, you know, not, not being like, oh, I'm not a writer, whatever, you know, just being like, no, this is, this is my heart. This is my mind. This is my reflections right now. And I am going to speak up and out about what this makes me feel like right now. Um, and I kind of started weeding through the other um, writings that I had done just kind of deliriously <laughs> through the whole pandemic. And I was like, wow, this has become an outlet for me. And crazily enough, and like starting to co-write shows with other people who I have worked with and, and just love and admire and respect and stuff, mm -hmm. I, I can't officially announce what it is, but like, I'm gonna get something produced in a festival this summer. And it's like, what? You know, and so it's, it's really um, kind of insane, just, I don't know. <laughs> The miraculous pivot, or you know, the ways that we've we've found to just cope and manage. I don't know. Now I'm just rambling, but that you know, writing has also been like so um, important in just managing through this crazy time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Rebecca. It's me now. Um, it's the miraculous pivot, I think, is a beautiful way of looking at this time, which has been incredibly fraught. But with it comes a lot of reflection and a lot of growth and, and a lot of opportunity, I think, for everyone to take a collective breath. And for that to reemerge in this new world with something, I think, really, truly new and beautiful to say. I, and I, I, there's something interesting about this moment because I, I think a lot of us have a commonality in theater. And that has been the, the main thing that has not been able to be done in this space. And there's been this collective worry and this burden that it's not gonna come back. But I think there's a hunger for community. There's a hunger for the immediacy. There's a hunger for a coming together. And it's, it's really gonna be lovely that it reemerges with hopefully enough space and breath for something truly beautiful and positive to grow out of it. So I'm very eager and looking forward to what comes next in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this idea of the, the miraculous pivot, um, you know, during this year, there's just been so much packed in in our time, so much of, of that we've witnessed, um, both beauty and trauma. And I'm so curious how it, within the art, and Lisa, you mentioned this a little bit in terms of just, you know, speaking your truth in writing and advocacy. What have been certain ways that you found yourselves, you know, becoming an act and you know, an advocate or participating in activist like activities, if you have, um, as a part of like speaking any any truth that you want to speak during this year.
I guess I can go again. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, since, uh, since uh, I guess almost a year ago now, um, with George Floyd's murder, you know, there, it was um, obviously, you know, we all experienced the shit, you know, and um, I was really grateful for the way that so many, I mean, obviously, the country, the world responded, you know, but at least locally within New York and even more specifically within Queens, people were showing up and making noise and going out in the streets. And um, I was really grateful to find a lot of community and solidarity in um, marches, vigils, you know, every possible way of just navigating through the the pain of the circumstances, but also recognizing, you know, the magnitude of what needed to change, truly reckoning with it. And, um, and thankfully within Queens, um, a grassroots group started and we started at Court Square Justice. Um, and we started after kind of just meeting and at for vigils regularly and doing some marches and stuff like that, we decided to break into working groups to kind of really focus on like, what are the action points that we want to be accomplishing? What do we really um, individually care more about? And I decided, even though there was an arts for activism group, there was um, also an option for interfaith um, work. And I have, um, and I felt more called to actually be part of that group because there are so many different voices, you know, speaking lots of different things. And uh, and I wanted to show up for racial justice because of my faith and not in spite of it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I feel really grateful that there are, that I feel like a lot of artists, you know, we are empathetic people who, literally tell other people's stories. Um, and so there were, the, the Arts for Activism group was huge. Like they couldn't even like meet at the same time. And, and so I, I felt grateful to find a smaller niche. Um, and we've been really active ever since then um, in in just figuring out ways to serve our local community. That And that's been, I mean, we're starting to get a little bit involved we, right, recently with like specific pieces of legislation. But oftentimes we've been really trying to find partnership with other interfaith leaders throughout Queens to be like, you know, because like within Queens, there is the largest um, housing for uh, in, in the entire hemisphere, um, project housing uh, is in Queens. And um, there's a huge community to serve uh, of like black and brown siblings right here. Um, and so, Anyway, that's that's been a, a way that while we have not had theater, um, you know, that I've been so grateful to find a, a different and literal physical community here in Queens of um, of just trying to find equity, seek equity, and fight for equity within our even our locale here. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And I know Rebecca, you said that you in your in your communication consulting, you do some work in checking people on their biases and and how to be proper communicators. How has that been during this time? It's been really wonderful to have a little bit of space and time to focus on that because working in, in communication consulting, so I work for a lot of different firms that use artists to basically parlay our skills of being able to be presentational, being able to know how to commune with people to help those who want to find a voice, want to find a way. And what's been really lovely about it is a lot more of it has been focusing on DEI, of getting into different communities. And even if it's as small as just helping people who are trying to work in terms of equity and inclusion. So not even necessarily the big divides, but just the, the interpersonal of looking and starting to examine their own biases. Uh, mm -hmm. That's been a real gift as it, it's, it me, makes and waits its way forward. But I think to Lisa's point, and when I, I look to Ray, what has been really lovely about this time and this sort of like little bit of reflection is it's given 
space to realizing that your voice matters and it has a place and looking to do the work that I do in terms of communication and putting that out there. And I'm really interested in what Lisa's doing and also where Ray is coming from of, of realizing that you have something to say and that it has a an impact in this moment, but in the larger moment that is going to have ripples that goes out and sort of looking to know how you are her making that and using that. Cause me and my own personal self, it, I can say like after George Floyd, I realized that I had been holding back my voice, not feeling like it had a place in this world for a really long time. And that that is something that I'm trying to make amends for and that I'm trying to, in this new, very interconnected community, find a way to get out there. And so I am really curious about the the other people. Lisa, you said you had some projects coming up and Ray, you are literally a person who puts words into the world in a beautiful way. And so I, I am appreciating what you do. I'm trying to emulate it. And I'm also curious about how you are continuing to do it. That's beautiful, Rebecca. Thank you for sharing that. Like out of this time, that is the blossoming that is so phenomenal that is that is worth celebrating. And I hope that so many people have also found that empowerment because it's there, it's palpable. And by you sharing your story, like I'm inspired by it and I totally relate to what you're saying. Knock or Ray? Yes. Um I I can I would like to share one experience I guess um, I'm not I'm not able to join any activist group like a big group but I will say something that more like personal for myself um, I was uh, have like some some production and reaching out to me and asked to do a show and every time when they ask to do a show I always questioning about like why are they asking me what is the reason like is it something uh, are they, um, is it because of like, they want to work with me? Is it someone that I have been working with and excited to working with? Or is the show is something that I exciting to work with? And there's this one time that there's a show that come to me and asked me to do uh, um, a person of color show. And every time when I got a person of color show, I always ask myself, is this because I'm a person of color? Is it, am I categorized to do this type of show? Why are they asking me? And what does the show require is not something that I'm interested in with. And I, and I did, when I have a conversation with the director, I asked like, why are, you, why are you asking me to do this show? And the director actually don't know and he he because he never see my work and he he don't know what like i capable of doing the show i'm i'm like believe that but i always wonder like why are you picking me i was like how how could we not like put in categorize to do some type of work even though you have so much more talents as a human being, as a person, have a different opinion on things. And or every time I have to do a show that I don't have experience, I learn so much. I have dramaturg and I have other cast and director who like inform me to help me grow and learn. And I want to empower that, that you can do whatever show like, and we are doing this art in order to learn and grow together. So this is something that I want to share. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Ray? I've uh, lost track a little bit of the question, listening to everyone speak. <laughs> well, um, yeah, could no you problem. Your, yeah. Absolutely. It was, you know, how do you, how have you, or how do you currently use your voice in sort of an advocacy or activist way? How have you found your voice in that way during this time? Um, you know, it, I, as as people who know my work, like I, I tend to speak very much from the experience of being a queer Filipino American. So there hasn't been, what's interesting is like, even as like uh, the industry has had its reckoning and things have been kind of just like these mo this moment of reflection has been happening. There are a lot of things about, you know, about predominantly white institutions and uh, a, a lot of theater boards and artistic staffs where it feels less to me 
where it, things are sort of catching up to where I've been working from the whole time, you know? And so uh, in terms of theater, I actually have been really shifting focus to, you know, I, I was kind of making a big stink when the pandemic began, um, kind of going after places that had been my artistic home or had done my work, asking them why they aren't um, basically converting all of their resources into artist support. Um, you know, like uh, I was very proud of my, you know, one of my artistic homes, the, my theater company who spent, who basically shifted everything that they were doing to be able to employ artists. They were, you know, uh, in different forms uh, during the pandemic and now have like, you know, they just, you know, benefits for artists doing micro grants you know, uh, for, for BIPOC artists. And so, you know, it really became a, it, to me, it was still that very same relationships with the, like, you know, people asking people to do panels like this, right? There, you know, there at the beginning of the pandemic, there were people asking, uh, particularly artists of color to do panels so that they could keep their institution alive. And, you know, some as, can happen sometimes that artists were not being paid. And, you know, and like mm -hmm. knowing that I actually have been, you know, uh, I have a little bit of clout in the theater, I would refuse <laughs> to do panels and ask them why they weren't paying. You know, like, I, I think like, you know, it comes to, it really is just, I'm still just in that sort of really day-to-day -day space in terms of what we can do as theater artists, like to just really be uh, honest engagement with other people in our field. And um, and simultaneously, um, because of the pandemic, all of my work has been uh, in TV uh, for the past 14 months. And so it's been an interesting shift for me because I'm sort of back to just being like one voice in the room and not a voice that gets a lot of attention. And for the first time in a long time, I'm in rooms that are where I'm usually the only one of something, uh, which in the theater, I had gotten to a place where my directors, my collaborators, my, you know, the designers who work on my play, all of my actors are people of color, you know? And so now I'm kind of like going, you know, I've had this moment to step back and be like, oh, what is this like again? Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, really just finding, uh, yeah, finding a way to use my experience, uh, being a sort of forward outspoken person in theater, like what can it, how, what can I do now in like a TV room where I have all of the ideas about how to do this, but really like don't have any of the, I, I, I'm new, you know, like I, you know, I, 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 I do not have any weight to throw around and, you know, and I do have to come into these rooms like really humble and ready to learn. Um, while at the same time already having an entire career's worth of experience to share. So, um, yeah, that's, I'm not sure if that was totally an answer to the question, but that's Absolutely what I've been hearing. Was. Absolutely. <laughs> and I love that you said that, you know, you've been thinking about activist work for a while and it shows in your writing. And now you feel like the world's kind of catching up to, you know, the country's kind of catching up to where you have always been. So. Thank you for that. And thank you for speaking that truth. And for all four of you, you know, there's 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 a lot to think about, myself included, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, my Angela would always refer to mental gymnastics um, when we think about just life in general and, and where we fit and what our voices are saying. And so I'm curious, how do you fill your cup and restore yourself when you are giving to the world, when you're giving to the art? How do you... What's your self-care like? What's your self-care like these days? I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna, I've been really indulgent, so I'm just gonna, so, okay, but <laughs> this is also bearing in mind, I'm in Seattle, and uh, Seattle is very, um, it, Washington State was the start of the pandemic, and it's, Washington is a state kind of full of rule followers. And so our pandemic, while it has been longer than a lot of other people's, has in some ways been a little easier. Uh, and so one of the things that I have that I know many people do not 
I have been getting a massage every month. <laughs> I've just been like, this is a thing I get, you know, like we're not, you know, we have had at times a lot more restrictions than other people and our restrictions are much slower to lessen. But when they do lessen, we know that we're safe because the state has been extremely cautious. And so, um, you know, it's like you don't have, you know, you're, you're making all of your food. I, you, I have been, as I said, employed in television during, so like, I'm like, oh, I can, I'm going to get a massage like whenever I want. And so I've been doing that. Uh, one other thing that is, does not require money, um, which I have rediscovered is, um, do you know, like in high school when you would just like sit in your room and listen to music? I yeah. don't really do that as an adult. And over the past few months, I I just do, like, you know, no, fo no phone, not watching TV, just like lay on the couch, put in, you know, today it was George Michael's Listen Without Prejudice, and then just listen to music. Um, it's been really helpful to be like, oh, there's, we have all of this time all of a sudden. And mm -hmm. um, you can actually not, be productive and not be an activist. <laughs> you can <laughs> sit like you're in high school and just listen to an album. Um, and I've been and really doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. And that kind of reminds me of um, uh, something that I've kind of discovered in the past few months. Uh, there's an Instagram handle called um, The Nap Ministry. Um, that's that amazing. Say, yep. And uh, there's a, a great organization called The Cosmos, which is an um, all Asian female company that um, encourages and and advocates for Asian women. Um, granted, after the Atlanta shootings, they kind of opened up some of their virtual events to just the AAPI community, but they have had these beautiful um, online um, events or, you know, things you could tune into um, around rest. And Ray, like what you just said about like, yeah, you can like not be productive for a second. Like, <laughs> my God, my my husband's probably in the other room being like, yeah, Lisa. Like, <laughs> So that's been, you know, but that it's, that is something that is like, a, it's a friggin' onion that I keep peeling during this pandemic of, this even like colonization of my own mind of how mm. obsessed I am with productivity mm. and how much I associate it with my worth, which is not indicative of my worth at all, you know? And so, but it's, it's literally as though I have to keep relearning this lesson. But the thing that I am grateful for is that I keep relearning the lesson I think, and I'm trying with more grace for myself each time and with more compassion for myself each time, um, because there is also just the fact of the matter that we are living in just, what is this time in history? You know what I mean? Like, this is nuts. This is epic. We're going to tell everything. Mean, this will be stories and legend for years, you know? And, and so it's like, um, you know, grappling between like, I just need to sit here and eat potato chips or like, how many things, how many things can I create? What else can I read? What am I doing with my life in this pandemic? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's been <laughs> so many learning of, the, of these much more introspective, smaller lessons for me. Um, and so like my, <laughs> My lessons in self-care have been almost constant. Um, and so it's just been, uh, you know, this this repeating, but though it's repeating, I am grateful for the re reinforcement of grace through my like living experience through this time so that I keep like, <laughs> I don't know, giving it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time I start being like, how productive can I be or whatever, you know? Um, so that and just like trying to relearn how I view rest and let myself have it and not earn it. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm totally related about those productivity. I was like, oh, how could I check my list of to-do lists? And then I was like, okay, what's the list now? <laughs> and okay, uh, my self-care right now, I think is a hot chocolate that I'm looking forward to have once a day <laughs> in the morning. My husband was like, Nope, you drink too much chocolate now. But it's like, but this is one of my joy that I'm looking forward to. <laughs> and another thing that I do is uh, going for a walk with my daughter. And it's always, uh, I appreciate more about like nature these days. I feel like I have more time to like see the nature, Shane, the leaf, the lake, uh, and see neighbor. I, I never know my neighbor. Mm -hmm. And now I see these people and it's like, oh, I know you. I see you walk here often. Oh, around this time. And there's a mom who walk out from the door every day at night, like 9, p 9 a.m. And then she will have a card and have her little son come out with her. And it's kind of like interesting to like start to see this routine of people that I never have a chance to yeah so. awesome that sounds good i want some hot chocolate now <laughs> Rebecca? I, i'm just thinking about you not particularly being a new mom in the midst of this and that this is counterintuitive to the idea of what do you do for yourself you're like i got to shower last tuesday it was great um <laughs> But it, it speaks to this larger thing, which I think is beautiful about everybody is saying there is a, a kind of appreciation that you can have in this rare moment in time. And part of it is the, the beauty that is going to be born out of it. I, I don't remember exactly what you said, Lisa, about like that this is a moment and that it's going to have sort of ripples that expand. You said it better, but that there's it's there's so rarely a moment in that we get to pause life like we're in the Truman Show. And it creates this sort of space where you will, can really appreciate the larger things, which is what we've been talking about, but also the tiny moments, that hot chocolate that you have, the nature, the, the, the ability to appreciate that you do not have to constantly be moving. And it's, it's been a gift. There's been this sort of reminder in this time of even with all of the turmoil and the fact that we've been kind of perpetually in fight or flight, that there's also this rare ability to see the large and the small with a slightly different perspective. And that's been really beautiful. And I see that in everything that you guys have said, like me as a person, I'm from Hawaii, so I got spoiled. I got to go home, lots of nature, lots of family, too much of both, but, uh, and also not enough. But that it, I'm appreciative of being able to be thankful for the hot chocolate and then being able to see the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, during this time, people are getting more vaccinated. Things are opening back up. Ray, as you said, you've been able to do massages and things like that, which is wonderful. And we know that theater is opening back up. As we know, um, we we all saw on Broadway World that all the different shows that are coming back to Broadway, and and um, and in light of we see white American theater, what changes? have you begun to see? Or what would you implement tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I see it stirring. I see it stirring. I mean, you know, one thing that is uh, something that I've experienced a little are, you know, focus groups and things like that. And one can hope that those might be helpful, productive, um, maybe some, you know, possibility for change in the future. Um, but as far as like, you know, other actions, it's like put marginal people from marginalized communities in power, in positions of power, you know, if you, you know, in terms of advocacy and giving voice, you know, sure, it's like great for, for actors to, you know, have a more even playing field, all that kind of stuff. But it's like, Yo, everything starts at the top, you know, and that's that's where I think there is the greatest. Well, no, that's I mean, I'm making broad generalizations, which can always be kind of, you know, disputed. But, you know, that's that's where I think the representation can truly have the greatest ripple effect, you know, in in I don't know 
potentially a trickle down that actually does some good. I don't know, but that's that's what strikes me is just marginalized communities, people of marginalized communities in positions of power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to echo that. I also want to shed some appreciation on both Nock and Ray their journeys and Lisa too, I know for firsthand and, and Jamie for everything, for putting your voices out there and saying, no, like knock, you were saying, I want to know whether you're choosing me because you see me or because you are looking for a BIPOC person for this, because that seems like it needs to be. And Ray, what you wear every day when you are telling your story and the fact that the three of us come from multiple heritage, but we're seen in the way that people want to see us most of the time. And it's, it's all the subtleties of identity. It's hard for me to know what's really happening out there because most of what I've done from an artistic sense is in my living room. Right now I'm not wearing shoes happening. And uh, it's, I don't know what's going on yet, but I am, to Lisa's point, interested in there being a shift in terms of who gets to make decisions. And I'm also interested in identity being something that we get to decide for ourselves and not mm -hmm. that it's decided for us. And that mm -hmm. is something that I am fully behind in every sphere, whether it has to do with race or gender or <laughs> sexuality, just letting that be a thing that it rings as a truth as we move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just you know to be totally frank. I'm just in a wait and see place. That's all. Like I don't, I don't really have much to add. I, you know, I I want to. We have seen a couple of seasons announced that I think are very interesting. You know, uh, and a couple of shows announced that are interesting, at least on the um, not for profit or like you know the regional theater level. Um, I, I think Broadway is strange right now. I, I'm not sure what they hope to achieve with some of the shows that they're announcing. But at the same time, like I do think, you know, uh, something that has surprised me that was such a wonderful thing was uh, Roundabout's recent reading series where they brought uh, a lot of work by African-American artists in hopes of like from the past in hopes of like showing, you know, sort of creating a continuity of the American theater canon and being like, these are plays by African-American African -American artists that played on Broadway or, you know, that we have buried or forgotten. And so I'm, I'm curious to see uh, what programs like that, um, what effect they have uh, and how long they go, you know, because there's all, you know, because it is, it's, you know, like there was that season where all of these theaters uh, tried to have gender parity and it lasted a year and then mm -hmm. things went back and then the pandemic happened. Right. So, <laughs> so, you know, so it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it really is the, the longer term look uh, that I'm curious about. Totally. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with Ray. Yes, it's like I see the chain that the season, the chain, uh, all the, the play they're reaching out. But then it's like, then what's next after this? Is it like, I wonder about like, is this because of the wave? Yes, we have to start from somewhere. But I hope that this is something that comes from genuine and not because of the trend or something. Yeah. Well, in our last five minutes together, we're going to do a lightning round where I'm going to pose a phrase or a word and um, you just fill in the blank with a short phrase or whatever comes to mind when I say this first. Okay, so three songs you cannot be without today. Rebecca, how about you? Three songs you can't be without today. Uh, Lovely Day, which I listen to every morning um, by Bill Withers who, who passed in the beginning of the pandemic. It's the way I start my day. Uh, something by Billie Holiday because she bring gives me joy and gives me strength. And the the third is like the, the thing. I think I had Queen in my head this morning, and it just would not go away. And it was uh, I want to be free, and it just kept on playing. Uh, so I awesome. <laughs> in the day, live my day, and then whatever the day will take me. 
Awesome. Nak, how about you? Three songs you can't be without today. Uh, this is the song that I play for my daughter this day. Uh, it's Levitation by Dua Lipa. She's her, fa like her favorite. She would dance with this song. Another song is uh, Watermelon Sugar High. Mostly this is basically a pandemic song because we were playing radio. <laughs> we we'll try to cope her to sleep and then now she just kind of like remember this song and she would be so excited to hear it. Uh, another song, okay, maybe a song for myself will be uh, A Summer Day by Joey Hisashi, which is an animation song from Spirit Away. Absolutely, yes, Joey Hisashi, I love it, I love it. Ray, how about you? Three songs you cannot be without today. You know, it's so, I, I listen to a lot of music, but right now the things that I am loving and I'm kind of obsessed with are, um, I always love the band James and there's a song Sound that I love by James. Um, I've been loving Posing in Bondage by Japanese Breakfast. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been loving, uh, well, Still Woozy had a new single called Kenny, which is fine, but Habit by Still Woozy is sort of, uh, those are the things on constant rotation lately. Love it, love it. Lisa, how about you? Three songs you cannot be without today. I'm cracking up over levitating. <laughs> Not because <laughs> literally, I just moved this weekend and there's just like a recurring bit now in my tiny, with my husband and cat, our tiny family, where we do this ridiculous, we've made our cat dance to levitating, so now it's a bit in our household. So that was happening so recently. And we've been, that's been like our moving anthem, so it's hilarious you just said that. Um, but uh, this morning, I, I often, when just like wanting like clean space and openness, um, Bach cello suites are a huge go to for me. Um, and uh, I, Kishibashi is an amazing artist. Um, there's a great song called Philosophize in it, Chemicalize in it, and it's just like, it's just dope. And it just has gotten me through so many different times of this pandemic of just listening to it. And he's awesome. And he's also a multi-instrumentalist, which I also think is awesome. And so, yeah. <laughs> awesome. I am definitely creating a new Spotify playlist tonight with all these songs. Um, okay, fill in the blank. Leadership is. Generosity. By example. Courageous vulnerability. Listener. Mm -hmm. Theater is. Friends. Community. Humanity. I was going to say open-hearted oh. open community, so with you, Nak. Mm -hmm. Just humanity. Great. And lastly, Nak and Lisa have been said, community is. Community is. Theater. Family. Mm. A place where you can come as you are. I think family for me as well. Thank you. Thank you. This was a lovely conversation, a lovely panel. And I thank you, Rebecca, Ray, Lisa, and Nock for giving us your time, your truths, and your lessons. I'm inspired by you. And I, I hope that you had a good time in our conversation together. Um, for those of you who are watching at home, I also hope that you had a good time listening to our conversation. And I hope it pushes you to celebrate or be proud of AAPI Month and stay curious, as our panelists have said, about how to promote justice, justice of all kinds and visibility for all. Special shout out to the folks who helped make tonight happen, both through organizing and getting the word out. This concludes our program for tonight. Thank you everyone.
Have a great evening. Thank you.